Hello there, I'm Erin Aid. This is Boom Bust, and here are some of the stories we're tracking for you today. First up, Iran is open for business, at least slightly, and at least for the next six months. We'll tell you about the groundbreaking deal designed to curb Iran's nuclear program and the implications it's having on the markets. And also, trend predictor Ger Gerald Salente joins me later on in the show to discuss Iran, Fed policy, war, pretty much anything else you can think of. He'll have it all. And finally, in today's big deal, Rachel Curzius and I discuss life, death, and everything in between. It's a loaded one for sure, and you won't want to miss it. And it all starts right now. story today, Iran. Now, a landmark agreement between Iran and six other world powers was reached over the weekend in Geneva. The deal is designed to curb Iran's nuclear program while staving off harsh new trade sanctions for the country. Now, the interim six-month deal temporarily freezes Iran's nuclear weapons production. However, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry acknowledged that enforcing the agreement may be more difficult than it was to reach it in the first place. The groundbreaking deal halts Iran's most sensitive nuclear activities while providing some relief to the country's crippling trade sanctions. However, it does not allow the OPEC member to boost oil sales for six months. The deal prompted oil prices to fall and world equity markets to rise on Monday as investors priced in an easing of Mideast political tensions and the lift that those could provide to the global economy. Elsewhere, a measure that would have gone further than any other developed nation to limit the compensation of banking executives was rejected by voters in Switzerland over the weekend. Now, the proposal to limit executive pay to 12 times that of a junior employee was opposed by 65% of Swiss voters. Now, Switzerland, a traditionally pro-business country, is home to five of Europe's top paid CEOs. However, opposition to excessive executive pay increased after the government bailed out UBS, Switzerland's largest bank, in 2008. In March, Swiss voters approved the so-called Fat Cat Initiative that gave company shareholders a binding vote on managers' pay and blocked severance packages. And finally, money spent on one's education is always a solid investment. So why not use some of those awesome returns you've been seeing on your Bitcoin speculation and pay for college? Well, now you can. Seriously, you can. Cypress University announced that Bitcoin is now an acceptable form of tuition payment. And not only will the country's largest university accept the virtual money, it also is offering a master's degree in digital currency. Now, the senior vice rector at the university said, quote, while digital currency is a relatively new concept, currency is one of the oldest human inventions. After needing a bailout from the European Union, the Cypriot economy is still recovering, and the university is encouraging its government to turn the country into a Bitcoin hub. Well, there you have it. We'll be tracking these stories and keeping you posted on all the latest. <laughs> Now, as we mentioned before, the nuclear agreement reached with Iran this past weekend gives the country relief from certain sanctions. This relief includes an easing on a variety of rules, but the deal has larger implications for geopolitics and foreign relations. Here to discuss is none other than Gerald Salente, trend forecaster and publisher of the Trends Journal. Gerald, thank you for being with us here today. Now, to start, what are your thoughts on this nuclear deal with Iran, and how do you see it playing out? Well, my thoughts are that this is probably the biggest achievement of the Obama administration. I mean, it's great for, it's great for the economy and it's wonderful for peace. What took me, Aaron, is that as I'm watching this unfold, is going through the media and looking the, at the type of coverage it's gotten. I think it's a huge deal. But if you pick up the New York Times today, it's over on the right-hand column, and it's very nebulous, long-term deal with Iran faces big challenge. If you go on the websites and you go to USA Today, 
for example, by midday, it wasn't even listed among the top stories. If you go to Yahoo, the same thing. So it's being downplayed in America, and I believe it's being downplayed because if you read between the lines, there's going to be a lot of challenges coming from Congress to derail this plan. Okay. So as I believe it's great for the economy, it's a very positive development for the Obama administration, particularly in light of the disastrous Obamacare launch and the other failures before him. But it doesn't seem to be playing that big. Even look at the stock market in the states. It ended just about flat today. Now, even though the deal does not allow Iran to boost oil sales for six months, do you see this drastically changing the energy landscape in the months to come? Absolutely, because you could see the softness in oil prices just over the last several months. And there's more supply than demand, and a lot of, of that supply has been held up coming out of Iran. And also, that could also be one of the major reasons why you have talk about Saudi Arabia aligning with Israel to stop Iran from doing this, this peace deal because it may mean more pressure on the OPEC states in terms of lower oil prices. But what's interesting to me about this is there's a geopolitical equation and there's the economic part of it. And you know, it's all about the bottom line. And I think that's why, despite the pressure coming out of Israel with Prime Minister Netanyahu going on endlessly about what a bad deal this is, making the rounds on American media at will, talking down this deal, the pressure coming from Congress on Obama not to go through with this deal, it really comes down to money. And it's a money issue in the sense that the money that's going into oil, into your gas tank, is not going into retailers' cash registers. And the economy in the United States is very weak. So this is a bonus for the economy, and I think that's why the administration put this ahead of Israel's concerns. That's an interesting take. Now, in this year's, your edition of the Winter Trends Journal, you focus heavily on the potential for war in 2013, this very year. Now, in, in this edition of the journal, you write, quote, I want to read this out loud. I provide an original, daring, and practical peace plan that will not only bring peace, but also help put the U.S. on the path to prosperity. Now, is this agreement, the Iran agreement, um, a step towards peace? Can you expand on your peace plan? Well, yes, in the sense that, look, you know, I'm a jazz fan. You listen to these old jazz songs during the 1940s. You know, we're going to get these dirty little Japs. And you, you, read, you listen to the ones about Hitler and, and on and on. And now who are our biggest allies? I grew up during the Vietnam War. Look what's going on with trade between the United States and Vietnam. So why this hatred that keeps going on between the United States and Iran? You know, people only have a one-dimensional view. You know, quickly, this is how I became a trend forecaster and a political atheist is I used to be in Washington, and Jimmy Carter came back on New Year's Eve from day after New Year's, New Year's Day after spending New Year's Eve with the Shah and his wife. And he announced to the American people that the Shah was the island of stability in the Middle East. And of course, that's when I started investing in gold and oil, because I looked at the implications. But Americans only remember the hostage takeover. They have no concept of America and the, and the UK overthrowing the democratically elected government of Mosaddegh in 1953. What I'm saying, Aaron, is if this is history. It's past. There wasn't a lot of bloodshed over this one. It's time to move on. And as I said, the business of the world is business. It's all about the bottom line. And the Iranian deal is a great bottom line deal for America, which isn't doing so great economically. Now, speaking of America, I'd like to talk to you about your upcoming Trends Journal coming out in December next month. What's your outlook for 2014, and uh, what is your next big prediction? The big one is with tapering, and, and that is we believe they're going to have to do it at some point. You just can't keep pumping this money into the system. 
And they're going to wait till after the Christmas holidays. They're not going to jeopardize a going crazy stock market just before the biggest retail season of the year. I believe they're going to do it in January. When they do it, interest rates are going to go up, despite they're trying to do everything to keep them down. Look at the data, just coming out in the last few days. New home sales, pending home sales are way off. They have to keep interest rates low. This is an interest rate recovery. If they start to taper, interest rates go up, the economy goes down, and when interest rates go up, the bond bubble explodes. That's what we're concerned about the most. And we're looking, again, there are wild cards. So you can never forecast this directly because, again, Iran right now is a wild card. That may be an economic booster. Absent of some big boost, we see some very bad times economically coming around March. Now, I want to pivot a little here. You mentioned the jazz age before, and in your most recent journal, you draw a lot of parallels between 2013 and the 1930s in terms of an uplifted mood. And you had the crash of 29, which was followed by the 1930s Great Depression, followed by currency wars, then trade wars, then World War II. And you wrote, quote, actually, uh, back then, no matter what their leaders said or promised, the public felt in their bones that the economy would, no, would not soon improve and that a war was on the horizon. In the mood for uplift, they turned to swing and dance their troubles away. Now, I got to ask you, uh, Mr. Salente, do you honestly think that the majority of Americans are doing that today, kind of dancing their troubles away? Oh, no, no, this is it. <laughs> you know, I just went this past weekend, I went to see the New Orleans Preservation Hall Jazz Band in Upper Here in Woodstock. And I remember the old days when you went to Woodstock and you could go out at night after the, after the band played. It's pig patrols everywhere. You can't go anywhere without being watched. There's no fun in Mudville. There, you cannot have a good time anymore. If, you're, if your license plate is, light is out, if you didn't put your signal on, if you're going seven miles <laughs> over the limit, they are clamping down on the people at levels like I've never seen before. I wanted to go out after seeing this great jazz band. You, Woodstock was closed down. Well, so no, they're not swinging their lives away. But what we're saying as trend forecasters, if the entertainment industry had that much of sensibility and sensitivity, this is what they would be producing instead of these Biebers and <laughs> Siley Myris, Miley Cyrus, or whatever, <laughs> sticking a tongue out. There you go. So now, wait, Gerald, Gerald, I'm sorry. Part. We have to go to a quick break, but stick with us because I want to hear more about this, and I actually agree about the Miley Cyrus part. Now, <laughs> but coming up, think too big to fail banks should be broken up. Well, how about too big to fail countries? We'll talk with Ger Gerald Salente about why the U.S. might just be too big to govern. And also, what can divorce rates tell us about the economy more than you might expect? Rachel Kurzius and I discuss marriage annulment as an economic indicator in today's big deal. And as we head to a quick break, here's a look at some of today's closing numbers. Come back. for you. Let's make a tea time. Stay away from that story. Let's get this guy elected. Let's smear that guy. Instead of working for the people, politicians and the mainstream media are working for each other. Bribery, Bribery stage shady. events, bias, and propaganda. I think I'd rather play alone.
with more from Trends forecaster Gerald Salente. Now, before the break, we were discussing geopolitics and the parallels between the 1930s and today, but now it's time to delve a little deeper into the Fed. Now, I got to start off by asking you, Gerald, in this segment, another parallel that, a parallel that has been made between the 1930s and today is the Fed's involvement in shaping the bubble. Now, in the past, you referred to the Federal Reserve as a banking cartel. And with last week's appointment of Janet Yellen as chairwoman of the Fed, do you believe this changes anything at all? And if so, how? That changes nothing. It's just a new face singing the same song with a different voice. No, I mean, she's just there as that, you know, following orders, doing what they do. You're not going to see any changes at all. Uh, they're really in a quandary. They don't know what to do. Aaron, what's going on is unprecedented, not only for the Fed, but for all of the central banks. Let's be honest about this and look at the facts. The only reason China is go going through what it's going through is they're dumping trillions of yuan into their system to keep it going. Look what's going on now with the ECB, the European Central Bank. They're going to be getting negative interest rates. You can't make this up. Look what the Fed has done with quantitative easing. Who ever heard of this term before? This is all uncharted territory. The only people it's helping are the financial markets. They cannot stop doing it. If they don't do quantitative easing, guaranteed, they will come up with a new scheme undreamed of that's going to be another way of juicing the economy with cheap money. Now, speaking of quantitative easing, it's recently been reported that policymakers have uh, discussed creating a program to buy short-term Treasury securities in order to keep yields low, even after QE3 taper. Do you see the possibility of a smooth exit plan for the Fed from quantitative easing? And basically, how much longer can rates stay this low? Yeah, I'm sure you have an opinion on this one. Yeah, they, they can't get out of it. If the money doesn't flow into the system, the system fails. Look, again, just look at what's going on with interest rates. You heard Ben Bernanke last week saying it, that people can buy automobiles. It's like a car dealer now, and I love it. Listen, you want a 0% interest rate to buy a car? Tell you what, you don't even need any income verification. You having trouble getting one? Answer one of those ads on TV that tell you they'll get you one even if you don't have a job. It's another version of the housing bubble. The Fed cannot get out of this. The economy should have declined back in 2009 and 2010, but they've been pumping tens of trillions of dollars into the system to keep it up. And by the way, this is not capitalism. In capitalism, they don't have four words, too big to fail. That doesn't exist in capitalism. You know, nobody's too big to fail. Actually, it's the merger of state and corporate powers better defined by someone who knew the term really well, Mussolini. It's called fascism. And that's what's going on. It's a corporate takeover of the government. It's in front of everyone's eyes. They cannot get out of this. They're going to have to keep interest rates low. They'll come up with any scheme they can. But in the meantime, it's devaluing the fiat currencies. Now, speaking of holding interest rates at an arbitrary position, the central bank has said that it will hold benchmark interest rates near zero at least as long as unemployment remains above 6.5 percent and the outlook for inflation is no more than 2.5. Do you think that these are wise or just arbitrary numbers that the Fed is targeting? Every, look, go back to the Fed minutes. Go back five years ago. They're there for everybody to read. Every one of them called it wrong. Not one of them saw a recession coming. You heard from Ben Bernanke saying there's never been such a thing as a national real estate decline since the Great Depression. He didn't see the mortgage problem as being one. There's nothing that Yellen or any of them called anything right. Of course these are guesses. And by the way, we can see low inflation. You can see a deflationary period. But what's also happening is the currency is being devalued. So it's inflation in a very different way. That's what happened, by the way, during the Great Depression. They made people turn in their gold. The dollar was pegged to gold at 
I think it was twenty dollars and sixty-two cents an ounce. FDR, they call the bank holiday. You had to sell back your gold. The dollar was pegged to gold. After they stole everybody's gold, or they sold it back to the Fed at twenty dollars and sixty-two cents an ounce. What they did was they repegged the price of gold to thirty-five dollars an ounce. Voila! Inflation didn't go up, but guess what? Your purchasing power declined by about seventy percent. So that's what you're seeing happening. Now, a lot of economists and in investors and trend predictors like yourself, they're talking about present-day currency wars. Can you tell us what your views are on the subject of currency wars? Well, they're going on. You know, first you had, which, oh, that's the other issue, by the way, with the tapering. All of this cheap money, that's what built the emerging markets up because the cheap money went to these hot markets where you had the currency trades. So that's stopping. If the, if the tapering stops, all these emerging markets start going down. So what are they being forced to do right now? Well, India, they're in terrible shape, but the rupee is going through the floor. So now they're being forced to raise interest rates to protect their currency. It's a currency war. Look what's going on in Japan. They're trying to devalue their currency, the yen, so their exporters could sell more stuff. Go back to the depression. It was a currency war that went on. You heard it coming from Mentega, the finance minister of Brazil. There's a currency war going on. And again, my greatest fear, by the way, is war. When all else fails, they take you to war. People have a very short memory. Just what a couple of months ago, President Obama was bombs away over Syria. Like that, they're ready to go. So if there's a false flag or a real attack in the United States, the whole game changes. Those yellow flags, those yellow ribbons, will be wrapped around everything that's not moving, and all those made in China American flags will be flying again. They'll go to war in an instant. And that's how governments get people's minds off bad economic problems. History tells us that over and over again. Gerald, thank you so much for your time. That was Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal. Time now for today's Big Deal. Rachel Curzius joins me now to discuss life, death, and everything in between. Fun things like divorce. <laughs> First off, the cost of divorce. And no, I'm not just talking about the emotional cost or the physical cost, both of which are on perfect display in the film War of the Roses. Check it out. When I look at you lately, I just want to smash your face in. Smash my face. I want a divorce. You can't have one. When a couple starts keeping score, there is no winning. It's only degrees of losing. I am the one who found this house. I bought everything in it with my money. It's a lot easier to spend than it is to make it, honey bun. You might not have made it if not for me, sweet cakes. Does not look like fun, but nothing like uh, a little money to spice things up, right? Now, here we go. Ballpark figures for a straightforward divorce is at least $5,000 per person, and that's mostly due to the cost of legal counsel. However, if child custody is involved in any way, then the cost per person doubles to about 10,000 bucks a piece. And if there's a business in the mix, whoo, the price, it keeps going up. Now, this has forced many couples in today's economy to ask, can we really afford a divorce? Rachel. Because of the expense, could rising divorce rates potentially signal kind of an economic recovery? Divorce rates go up. The economy is doing better, no? I think in a way it is a good economic indicator in the same way where as we're seeing record numbers of, of children and not children, excuse me, 20 year olds sticking at their parents' house shows that the economy isn't doing very well. In the same way as we can imagine couples choosing to stay together even though they're not happy rather than, you know, establish their own domiciles. I think that that is a pretty good thing because I mean, not only does it cost money every month for rent, not only does it cost to have a lawyer or anything like that. I mean, imagine having to establish 
your own home. You your need a whole new style. dining set. Exactly. And you don't have the wedding gifts to get the new blender. You're going to need to buy it yourself. But it also brings up the question, when, when boom times are around, do people just get along better? You know, maybe, maybe it could, is it? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's an, that's an interesting point as well. Maybe, though there's more to fight about. You know, a, a great philosopher of our time once said, Mo money, mo problems. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure if that works, but I do think that people who um, are unhappy are more likely to stay together just because they can't actually deal with a divorce at, at the time. And I think that that's a very good economic indicator. Now, this is crazy to me. Check this out. For those who want to take a different approach, the I Split Divorce app, five bucks for the app, lets couples divide assets and liabilities on their iPads, their uh. iPads. Now, maybe a more economical way to organize a divorce, but this certainly doesn't take care of the major expenses, I, at least I don't think so. Do you see any market potential here, Rachel, for you know divorce products, at least those that take and make the process cheaper. Potentially, this is so I mean, but, sad. If but let's say the couple only has one iPad. My parents split an iPad. Who would get the iPad and then oh, be able to make all right, of those choices? So you know, again, if the, if a couple is splitting up and losing everything, I mean, ho I think that apps like that are exciting for people because, as we said, the cost of legal counsel for divorce is sometimes prohibitive for couples. But I think that it all just goes back to maybe you need to get a prenup. I know it's seen as a little gauche, but. It's, it helps in these it times helps. of need. It's like people used to yeah. think that life insurance was tacky. But guess what? We all die, and 50% of us get divorced, too. Speaking of death, this is a fun way to end this fun segment. Ooh. Now, Nishama.info, it's a social network site for the dead, just launched last month. And the website is for relatives to record and preserve information of those who have passed away. Could this catch on? Do you think this site is... It could. A good I mean, idea. You already see this on Facebook, right? People have memorial pages as well as a dead person's Facebook often becomes a memorial to them. So I think that this could already work. I mean, I looked at this site. It's, it's a little prettier and a little bit more community-based, right? It's like the actual graveyard, and you can visit the tombstone of your relative, and it seems like others as well. It's kind of more like a message board with better graphics. The paperless post uh, of the Evite? Exactly. Nothing wrong with Evite, but just a <laughs> little, little more done. All right, well, I wish we could talk done. about this for a long time, but that's all the time we have for now. However, you can see all segments featured in today's show on YouTube at youtube.com slash boombustrt. We also love hearing from you, so please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash boombustrt. From all of us here at Boombust, thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.